straight ahead on 12 News, a trip of a lifetime. See how students in the Robbinsdale School District and beyond will get a life-changing civil rights lesson. Plus, a push to save the tower. When it's gone, it's gone forever. We'll have the latest development that could bode well for Osseo's iconic landmark. But first, a vigil and a search. And we will not stop until he is found. The latest on efforts to find missing 10-year-old Barway Collins. 12 News starts right now. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Alexandra Runslow. And I'm Mike Johnson. As we went to air Tuesday afternoon, we were expecting an update on the search for the missing 10-year-old boy from Crystal, Barway Collins. The boy disappeared last Wednesday shortly after he got off his school bus. Reporter Sonia Goins has the latest on the investigation. Mike and Alice, a press conference is about to get underway at 4.30. The police chief told me she's doing everything she can to bring Barway Collins back home. Meanwhile, the community is rallying behind the family. Songs and prayers to bring Barway back. Monday night, a vigil was held to give Barway's parents hope. Whatever he is, if he can hear us, he should be assured that we are fighting to get him back. The boy who likes to read and play Scrabble was last seen at the entrance of the Cedarwood apartment building where he lives. We miss Barway. I was gone for a very long time now. As you can imagine. Today is Monday. Tuesday and Wednesday are going to be a week. His parents. A very, very long time. Pierre and Yame Collins are distraught. Begging and asking. Over not knowing where their son is. To look out there. Even the person who is holding Baba away to release him. We really miss him. We miss him back. Please. Please bring our boy back. Please. Pierre Collins says he's upset authorities didn't issue an Amber Alert, but that's not his main focus now. He just wants his son back. We miss him. Let him come home. The Crystal Police Chief says investigators are working around the clock to find Barway. That is our number one goal, our number one focus, and we will not stop until he is found. In Crystal, Sonia Goins, 12 News. The Crystal Crime Prevention Board is now offering a $1,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person responsible for the boy's disappearance. You can go to our website, 12.tv, for the latest developments on this story. A St. Patrick's Day ruckus in downtown Minneapolis has now led to charges against a 21-year-old New Hope man. Elijah Morgan Hamilton is charged with second-degree riot stemming from the incident in which police say many young people rode free buses downtown to cause trouble. According to authorities, Morgan Hamilton had a knife in his hand as he tried to run from police. 16-year-old girl and 15-year-old boy also face charges. Their cases are in the juvenile justice system. Brooklyn Center Police have released a new report on crime, and it shows falling numbers for both violent and property crimes. According to 2014 city police data, violent crime has fallen to its lowest total since 1999. There were 97 violent crimes last year. Meanwhile, property crimes, which include burglaries and thefts, fell to the lowest number since at least 1985. About the only crime statistic that had some sort of increase was prostitution. There were three cases in 2010 and a total of 10 last year. The effort to save Osseo's 100-year-old water tower passed a milestone. A consultant told the city council this week it is eligible to be included in the National Register of Historic Places. What we find is, is that they're just disappearing. That's one reason Alexa McDowell says Osseo's century-old water tower is worth saving. McDowell is an architectural historian hired by the city to determine whether the unused tower has enough significance to be considered a historic place. In a water tower, the, me the thing you immediately look at is, does it have a role in the history of a community? And most water towers do. They tell us something about uh, at, at what point in the history of Osseo were they at a place where they realized that their community needed a water tower in order to serve the people who lived there? Built in 1915, the tower stands 127 feet over the city of Osseo. It was a common style then, but McDowell's 86-page report says it's unique today because there are only six towers like it in the National Register. Yes, it's a part of your history that's important. I was just thrilled that 
it is eligible for listing. Kathleen Getty has been an active supporter of getting it in the National Register. She says this is an important first step toward finding the money for needed repairs that are expected to reach $300,000. That is what the register does. It opens up a process for grants for rehabilitation and preservation. Getty says support for the structure has been growing during the two years she's been working to keep it from being torn down. When it's gone, it's gone forever. So now is the time to take the steps and, and see what we can do to save it and preserve it. There are a couple more steps to go to save the tower. Next, the Minnesota Historical Society will weigh in over the next 30 to 60 days. And if it gets support there, then it goes to a committee to decide whether it actually makes it into the National Register. The tower might celebrate its 101st birthday before its supporters know what will happen. At the state capitol, the Republican-controlled House passed a bill that it believes will relieve wage pressures on restaurants. The House approved a bill that would create a lower minimum wage of $8 an hour for tipped employees. That's a dollar less than the new $9 an hour minimum that goes into effect in August. The vote was 78 to 55, with seven DFLers in favor. Supporters of the House bill say it will preserve waiter jobs at table service restaurants. Opponents, like Re Representative Ryan Winkler, of Golden Valley call the bill, quote, a penalty on people who earn tips for their hard work. There will soon be a new face to rally Hawk Pride at Cooper High School. The Robbinsdale School Board has approved the hire of Frank Herman to become Cooper's next principal. Herman is the current assistant principal at Highview Learning Center. He also heads the district's career and college readiness efforts, a role that he will continue to serve. Herman replaces Christina Hester, who will become the new principal of the Fair School in Crystal. About 60 high school students from Cooper and other West Metro schools are about to set off on a spring break trip designed to serve as a life-changing history lesson. The students will take an eight-day bus trip to the south as part of the Civil Rights Research Tour. These are photos from last year's trip with stops that included the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama and the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee, where Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. The trip is designed to give students a deeper sense of history beyond what they read in textbooks and those who went last year say it's an eye-opening experience. To me they're gonna be life change um, because the information that they don't know it will move them forward. When you gain a different perspective from what you think you know and what you think is true uh, when you find out that there are some uh, deficiencies in the stories that have been told I think they have an awakening that is really powerful to young students. Students put together a documentary on their trip last year, and this year's group is also expected to document and journal their experience for their schools and community when they return. Coming up, we are talking toxins <laughs> next in Health Check, what you can do to help your body hit the reset button. Then later in sports, get set for spring. The Maple Grove softball team prepares for a big season. But first, it doesn't feel so much like spring. Chilly temperatures linger through Friday. Now that the winter is over, many people will begin the process of spring cleaning to get ready for those summer months. But spring cleaning doesn't just apply to your home. In today's Health Check, Blaine Cleveland takes a look at how to spring clean your body. So you're going to go down, nice, slow and controlled, just till your lower back touches. The benefits of working out are numerous. Nice job, you guys, nice job. Yet sometimes, even people who exercise regularly and eat a healthy diet and try to crunch all the way up need extra help to feel and function properly. Crossing up and over. Or to get over a weight loss plateau. Our ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis depends on the quality of the inside of your body. Nice and controlled. Lifetime Fitness personal trainer Carrie Anderson says, our bodies are exposed to toxins on a daily basis. So through the food we eat, the air we breathe, the water we drink, even the stuff we put on our skin, um, we need help in eliminating all those toxins. Your body typically can't keep up with it all. To help the body, walk it up, walk it down. She suggests people go through a detox program to essentially reset their system. I recommend it for my clients anywhere from like two to four times a year. She says a detox lasts 21 days and involves some strict dietary changes. So those first seven days, we're gonna eliminate or start to cut down 
the amount of sugar, the amount of processed foods we eat, the amount of caffeine and alcohol. People on a detox will cut those out of their diet completely over the next two weeks and replace them with protein shakes, nutrition packets, and healthy meals. This is a typical meal that people could have. We're looking at a healthy fat, whole grain, and uh, vegetables. She says the average person who sticks to the 21 day plan will see a difference. We'll lose anywhere from five up to 20 pounds of fat mass. Ultimately, it may sound like a difficult task, but she says a detox can help set people up for future success. After doing something like a cleanse or a detox, you notice it's a lot easier to maintain and, and eat healthier. Your palate has completely changed. In Plymouth, Delaine Cleveland, 12 News. The cost for someone looking to do a detox at Lifetime Fitness runs about $220. Participants will also receive a guide showing foods you can and can't eat. Well, coming up, loose change adds up quickly to help support a good cause. But first in sports, the softball team at Maple Grove has high hopes for the season. John Jacobson has that and more when we come back. seems like softball always starts out the year as an indoor sport, at least for working out and, and practice and stuff like that. But uh, there should be outdoors pretty soon now. I would think so. Certainly we're ahead of where we were the last two oh, right. springs for sure. So a welcome sign. Despite the recent snow, it's officially spring now, and local teams are gearing up for the start of the season. As Jay Wilcox reports, it could be a big season for the Maple Grove softball team. If they want to move up, there's only one more step to take. The Maple Grove softball team returns eight starters from a state class 3A runner-up team. So expectations are pretty high this spring for the Crimson. Um, I feel really good about our team. We have a lot of returning seniors. Um, so I feel like we'll be good again this year and hopefully we'll make another run for that state title. Standout pitcher Sydney Smith returns for her fourth year starting. The LSU recruit was dominant last season with a 21 and two record and 259 strikeouts. Maple Grove returns good talent all around the diamond, including speedy center fielder and offensive catalyst Sammy Sadler. They're seeing good work in the indoor workouts. Uh, I think we're doing pretty well. We're working pretty hard. We're doing a lot of reps and just hitting, getting back into hitting. Yeah, the girls are putting in a lot of hard work and everyone's giving it their all because we want to get back to that place that we were last year. So everyone's giving 100%. A spring trip to Cocoa Beach, Florida should get the team in game mode too. Well, I think it's really good to start playing on a normal field at the beginning of the year. That's um, a lot different than the turf, obviously, because of how the ball reacts on the field. But it also helps in uh, team bonding as well because now we get a feel of how that will play out in the normal season. It's tempting to already be thinking about the state tournament, but the Maple Grove girls know they have to take one step at a time. We try to think about winning conference, winning the first game, doing the little things like winning scrimmages and like getting better as a team. And then if we do all those little things right, hopefully we'll make it there. So, Jay Wilcox, 12 Sports. Maple Grove leaves this weekend for their trip to Florida. The season opener is set for April 8th at Blaine. With the end of the state girls basketball tournament Saturday, the winter sports season is complete for another year. On this week's Sports Jam show on Channel 12, Jay Wilcox and I reveal the choices for our all-area teams in boys and girls hockey and basketball. Here's part of what you'll see. Our boys basketball team starts with an award winner. Number 15, J.T. Gibson of Champlin Park had a superb season for the state runner-up Rebels. Star Tribune Metro Player of the Year, Mr. Basketball, and Gatorade Minnesota Player of the Year, Gibson averaged 19 points, 4.5 assists, and 2.7 steals. Gibson all the way, and he'll throw it down. Gibson's teammate, number one, Marty Hill, will join him in the Minnesota All-Star Series. The senior averaged 17 points, 6 rebounds, 3 assists, and 2 steals. A great leaper and shooter, Hill made 69% of his two-point field goals. We begin in the middle, and Park Center's number 22, Michaela Hayes. A too strong Hayes there for the rebound and put back. The six-foot-one-inch sophomore averaged 15 points, nine rebounds, and nearly four blocks per game for the Pirates. Hayes was named All Northwest Suburban Conference and third team All Metro. Number 14, Champlain Park junior big Hannah Crimble helped lead the Rebels to 14 wins this season. A six foot three inch junior topped her team in scoring at 13 and a half points per game 
while also leading the team in rebounding. Crimble was named all Northwestern Bremen Conference. Let's start up front with the top scorer among local players, Maple Grove's number four, Josh Passel. The senior captain netted 22 goals to go along with 30 assists. Passel was named all Northwest Suburban Conference. A goal for Passel! Number 11 for Wyzetta, Sophia Shaver, stood out in the Ultra Tough Lake Conference and was a Ms. Hockey finalist. Though she missed several games while playing with the U.S. Junior National Team, Shaver had 17 goals and 8 assists for the Section 6 AA runner-up Trojans. She signed with Wisconsin. You can see those teams in full this week on Sports Jam, plus highlights from three state girls basketball championship games. Watch it through Wednesday at 3.30, 6.30, and 9.30 p.m., plus at 7 a.m. Wednesday and Thursday mornings here on Channel 12. A handful of local players win the NCAA tournament in men's basketball, and a Plymouth man helped his team in the NIT. Number 15, Markel Curtis is a redshirt junior for Tulsa. The Armstrong High School grad at six points, five rebounds, and two steals Monday night. Tulsa was eliminated from the NIT by Murray State. Curtis averaged seven points this season while starting 27 games and had a career-high 21 in Tulsa's first NIT game. But an end of the season for him Monday night. Still overall pretty good year. Yeah, thanks a lot, John. Still ahead, a special mission that links local elementary students with kids in Mexico. We'll be right back. And finally, the pennies are piling up more than ever at Osseo District Elementary Schools. For the 13th year, elementary students are collecting money to help students in Sasabe, Mexico, a rural community near the border. Much of it is extra change that has piled up. And listen to this. This year, students and staff expect to raise $12,000, which will help pay for school supplies. I think it has been very successful, not only for the students in Mexico that we're helping to go to school, but also for the students here in Minnesota who are learning a lot about another culture and learning that they can make a big difference in the world. When I was uh, younger, my mom was a single mom with five kids, me and my four brothers, and she couldn't really afford to buy school supplies. So uh, I just wanted to like, go raise money for the kids in Mexico so that they can go to school. And it forward. Some of the students, including Hunter, will be able to personally deliver the supplies during a trip to Mexico in late, uh, in late April. The money will also help pay for ceiling fans in every classroom since there is no air conditioning. And a lot of days students there go to school when it's more than 100 oh, degrees, so that is a big deal. What an experience for yeah, the local absolutely. kids as well. That's it for now. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Community Corner is coming up next. <laughs>